Hello and welcome to this Taylor Wesley webinar on the subject of Supplementary Protection Certificates. My name is Simon Cohen and I'm joined by two colleagues, Judith Krenz from our Amsterdam office and Paul England with me here from our London office. We've noticed over the years that references from the European Member State Court to the CJEU on matters of interpretation of the FPC regulation tend to go fit in fits and starts. We're having one such period at the moment when references have been made, to, many references have been made to the CJEU about FPCs, hence the reason for this webinar. So in the next 45 minutes or so, we want to bring you up to date with the questions being referred, with what questions are being referred and why. Most of these concern two things, exactly what products can be protected by an FPC and how exactly they must be specified in the underlying patent. This is where most of our focus will be today, but there's a little more to it than that. As you will hear, many of the current referrals to the CJEU stem from earlier rulings which have been less than clarifying. At least in part as a result, differences of approach to the FPC regulation and the rulings of the, of the CJEU are still occurring in the national courts. Furthermore, and in part perhaps because of the criticism that has been made about this, the EU Commission is currently asking for responses to a consultation on FPC reform. We will look at this broader context of FPC reform at the end of this webinar. But before we get started, let me say that we would welcome any questions. You can send these using the Q&A icon in the middle of your screens. We will then get back to you by email as soon as we can after the webinar. Please hold on, uh, also hold on for a moment for the survey that will pop up on your screen as soon as the webinar finishes. We use the feedback, to, we use the feedback you give to decide on future webinar topics and how to improve them. Okay, so let's start by reminding ourselves what the SBC regulation is for and what it says and then go on to the subject of products. For this, I'm going to hand over to Judith Krenz in Amsterdam. Judith. Thank you, Simon. Um, the SPC uh, system is governed by European legislation, regulation number 469-2009, which means that the ultimate decision-making body on SPC is the Court of Justice of the European Union. Most are probably familiar with the policy reasons for providing SPC protection. SPCs are designed to provide additional market exclusivity for an authorized medicinal product when significant time has been lost on the underlying patent term as that marketing authorization was awaited. However, as with patents, it's important that the SPC system maintains a balance between encouraging research on the one hand and allowing third-party competition on the other. So there are limitations on the circumstances in which SPC protection can be allowed. These are set out in a number of conditions in Article 3 of the SPC regulation. It says in 3A that the product is protected by a basic patent in force. B says, a valid authorization to place the product on the market as a medicinal product has been granted. And C, the product has not already been the subject of a certificate. And finally D, the marketing authorization is the first authorization to place the product on the market as a medicinal product. Besides from that, there's important definition of a product. This is in Article 1b as follows. Product means the active ingredient or combination of active ingredients of a medicinal product. The subject areas that Simon said we're focused on today relate mostly to these specifically Article 3a and 1b and the related questions of what sort of products can be protected by an SPC and how specifically must the product be protected by a basic patent in force. Well, let's start 
at the definition of product in Article 1B of the SPC regulation, which says that it is an active ingredient or a combination of active ingredients. The attempt to draw a line around what is an active ingredient and therefore a product for the purpose of the SPC regulation has proved difficult. Until July 2012, the DGEU authority on the meaning of active ingredient in Article 1b had appeared to take a strict approach, as exemplified by the decision in Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In MIT, an SPC was not permitted for a combination of the cytotoxic agent Karmenstein and the polymeric matrix Polyfeprosane. In circumstances where there was a marketing authorization for Karmenstein alone before the authorization for the combination. This decision was because polyfeprosan was not regarded as an active ingredient. It is a substance that does not have a therapeutic effect on the human or animal body of its own, but merely provides a pharmaceutical form for the active ingredient to work. The combination could not therefore be a new combination of active ingredients. Furthermore, in YISM research, the CGEU ruled that product in Article 1b must be interpreted strictly to mean the active ingredient and could not include the therapeutic use of an active ingredient protected by the basic patent. In summary, these two decisions were authority that the product is an active ingredient per se, not an excipient or other non-therapeutic substance and not a second medical use. This approach then came into question in July 2012 with the ruling in Durham Pharmaceuticals. This case actually addresses Article 3D of the SPC regulation rather than Article 1B. But because Article 3D also relies on the definition of product, it is difficult to reconcile with the strict approach by the CGEU, as I shall explain. In NURIM, under Article 3D, the CGEU ruled that melatonin, specifically for the treatment of insomnia in humans, could be subject to an SPC on the basis of a marketing authorization granted for this purpose in 2007. This was beside the fact that melatonin for different purpose, regulating the seasonal breeding of sheep, has already been the subject of a marketing authorization granted in 2001. At first instance, Arnold J. decided that the strict approach taken in MIT, YISM, and other authorities meant an SPC could not be granted. Melatonin, as an active ingredient, had already been the subject of a first marketing authorization. But on referral, as I've said, the CGEU did not agree. It held that SPC protection for a second and subsequent use of a known active ingredient is permissible. In doing so, it appeared to follow the Advocate General's opinion by adopting a teleological approach to the meaning of product rather than a strict one. In essence, this means the court should look to the purpose of the SPC regulation, which is, very broadly, to provide sufficient protection for the investment made in the research and development of medi medicinal products. In short, NERM allows a product to extend not just to an active ingredient, but to, the, to a new use for an active ingredient. Not surprisingly, the investment-based teleological approach of the CGEU that resulted in this decision has since been relied on by applicants in SPC applications for a number of products that would probably not fall within the strict approach. Well, let's take a look at these now. We start with adjuvants. Are these active ingredients? Well, ClaxoSmithKline Biologicals 
concerned applications for an SPC on both an adjuvant called ASO3 combined with an antigen, an influenza virus component, and on the adjuvant alone. Specifically, the applicant argued that an active ingredient includes the ASO3 adjuvant in its own right. At first instance, in the English patent court, the expert evidence established that the estrogen adjuvant had no therapeutic effect of its own, but merely enhanced the therapeutic effect of the antigen when combined with it. But the applicant argued that the strict authority of MIT did not apply in this case, because it only excludes from SPC protection minor variants of a product, such as new doses, different salts and esters, and different formulations, which have no physiological effect on the body. Instead, it was argued ASO3 has the physiological effect of enhancing therapeutic action of the antigen. The applicant also relied upon the argument in Neurim that the SPC regulation was intended to apply to products that are the result of innovative research. Upon referral, the CGEU decided that an adjuvant to vaccine having no therapeutic effect of its own was not an active ingredient capable of protection by an SPC, either alone or as a combination of active ingredients with a vaccine. The decision in GSK Biologicals therefore appeared to limit the application of the teleological approach to ingredients capable of their own therapeutic effect, as previously thought. But then, a very similar issue was tested in the context of reformulations of an active ingredient in Bayer Crop Science, which is on the next slide. The CGEU ruling in Bayer Crop Science concerned what is called a safener, that is, a substance or preparation which is added to a plant protection product to eliminate or reduce phytotoxic effects of the product on certain plants. But safeners are not themselves active pesticides. And on the fact, the referring court held that they could at most only be said to have an indirect effect on plants. Could these be the subject of an SPC, under the Plant Protection Product SPC Regulation 161096? This regulation is drafted in closely similar terms to the SPC regulation, and the Bundespatentgericht referred to the CGEU the question whether the terms product and active substance which are parallel to the definitions in the SPC regulation, could be interpreted as including a safener. In this case, the CGEU ruled that product and active substance may include a substance intended to be used as a safener, where that substance has a toxic, phytotoxic, or plant protection action of its own. Importantly, the ruling suggests that this action does not need to be limited to action directly on harmful organisms as a protective substance, but may also include its protective action indirectly with the plant protection product. In this respect, if one compares the action of a safener with an adjuvant, which could also be said to have an indirect effect, the two cases appear inconsistent. Then there was another referral to the CGEU in Arne Forestgren concerning a conjugated carrier protein, protein D. An application was made to the Austrian authorities for an SPC on protein D. Protein D is present in a pneumococcal vaccine for uh, pediatric use called Synflorix, which is subject to a marketing authorization. This is the marketing authorization that the SPC applicants relied on. 
In Simflorex, protein D is a carrier protein conjugated by covalent bonds to several climacical polysaccharide serotypes and absorbed on aluminium phosphate. While protein D does not contribute to the activity of Simflorex, the applicants argued that it does have active properties of its own, albeit that these are against Haemophilus influenzae and not covered by the Simflorex marketing authorization. Could an SPC be granted on the basis of an active ingredient that is covalently bound to other active ingredients in a medicinal product? The CEEU ruled that it is possible for an active ingredient to give rise to the grant of an SPC, where it is covalently bound to other active ingredients in the authorized medicinal product. However, the SPC is not permitted, as in this case, for an active ingredient whose effect doesn't fall within the therapeutic indications covered by the marketing authorization. The CGEU was also asked to slightly, the slightly different question of whether, as a carrier protein conjugated to pneumococcal uh, polysaccharides used in synfluorix, protein D could be regarded as an active ingredient of the pneumococcal uh, vaccine. In particular, Relying on the ruling in biocrop science, the applicant argued that protein D contributes to the induction of a specific immune response to the pneumococcal um, polysaccharides to which it is conjugated. However, the CGEU was apparently unwilling to make a comparison with biocrop science and left it for the national court to determine whether these claims affect amounted to pharmacological, immunological, or metabolic action of their own. So it's now unclear where the buyer authority stands. There is one more referral to the CGEU on this subject area, which was made earlier this year. This is Abraxis Bioscience, which addresses the apparent inconsistency between Article 1B and Article 3D. Abraxis markets NAP Paclitaxel as Abraxane. This comprises Paclitaxel formulated albumin bound nanoparticles. According to Abraxis, NAP Paclitaxel, rather than Paclitaxel, is the active ingredient of abraxane due to the site association of paclitaxel to albumin. The UK Intellectual Property Office refused Abraxis application for an SPC on the basis that paclitaxel is the active ingredient of NAP paclitaxel, and paclitaxel is the subject of an earlier marketing authorization. In light of the authorities, in particular MIT, GSK Biologicals, and Forsgren, Arnold G. in the English Patent Court concluded that Article 1B must be interpreted narrowly and that an active ingredient is a substance which produces a pharmacological, immunological, or metabolic effect of its own. The role of albumin did not change that paclitaxel was the active ingredient of NAP paclitaxel. And case law on Article 1b was considered sufficiently clear on this that no reference was required to the CGEU. However, Arnold G. then dealt with the related issue of Article 3d. Under this provision, Abraxas argued that, in light of NURIM, Article 3D of the SPC regulation was capable of protecting a new formulation of an old active ingredient. The judge observes that the CGEU's reasoning in NURIM does not make clear how its decision on the meaning of a product under Article 3D 
can be reconciled with previous case law on Article 1b. Due to this uncertainty, the judge has referred the question to the CGEU, which, in essence, asks if Article 3d is to be interpreted as permitting the grant of an SPC for new formulation of an old and previously authorized active ingredient. But the judge has expressed his own view that it is inconsistent with the strict interpretation of Article 1b to interpret Article 3d in this way. There's one more case to mention on the subject of product, but this does not actually concern Article 1b or 3d. Instead, it is about Article 2, which states that any medicinal product protected by a patent and subject to a marketing authorization is capable of SPC protection. Rather than a simple medicinal product, however, the case relates to Boston Scientific's application for an SPC on a stand having paclitaxel as an integral part. The German Federal Patent Court has referred to the CGEU the controversial question whether the SPC regulation applies to combinations of pharmaceuticals and medical devices. In particular, the German court has asked the CGEU if an authorization granted for a drug device combination pursuant to Article 1.4 of the Medical Devices Directive has to be considered equivalent to a marketing authorization according to medicinal products. Directive. If the drug component has been examined for quality, safety, and usefulness by a member state authority for medicinal products in a procedure comparable to that in the Medicinal Products Directive, the German court thinks there should be equivalent. It argues that the wording of Article 2 SPC regulation only excludes the grant of SPCs for pure medicinal uh, medical devices and not drug device combinations. In, the, in its view, what matters is whether the authorization in question meets the procedural and substantive requirements for an authorization of the medicinal product directive. It will be very interesting to see what the CGEU decides about this. And it's notable that one of the arguments being relied on is again that a broad interpretation to include such SPCs would be consistent with the sense and meaning of the SPC regulation as incentivizing further pharmaceutical research and development activities. This is the thread that runs through all these cases from Nurim onwards. And although it has no doubt resulted in a broader approach to the products that can be protected in some respects, such as medical, a second medical use. Um, there do not seem to be uh, there do seem to be limits, although, as I've described, these these do not all appear consistent. That brings us up to date on the cases about products. So let's move on to the other big SPC issue on which clarity is needed. How must the product be identified by a basic patent in force under, under Article 3A in order for an SPC to be permitted? To discuss this, I'm going to hand over to Paul England in London. Paul. Thank you very much, Judith. So, to understand how this issue has developed, it first helps to examine the aspects of the CJU's ruling in the Medeva case that concern Article 3A. Medeva concerned applications in the UK Intellectual Property Office for five SBCs. These sought protection for different combination vaccines against diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough, poliomyelitis and or meningitis. In support of these applications, Medeva cited a number of marketing authorizations. Common, common to the marketing authorizations was the combination of two things, 
pertactin and filamentous hemagglutin antigens. Although each authorization contained other additional antigens in varying combinations, the European patent on which Medeva based its SBC applications was for a method of preparation of an acellular vaccine against Bordella pertussis, whooping cough agent. This vaccine, as claimed in the patent, also consisted of a combination of the two antigens, pertactin and filamentous hemagglutinin. But, unlike the combinations which the marketing authorizations were granted, these were not combined in the patent with any other antigens. Now, in four of the five SBC applications made by, made by Medivere, SBC protection was sought for combinations of more active, active components and ingredients than were covered by the claims of the patent. So the question was, is the patent capable of being a basic patent in force for the purpose of Article 3A SBC regulation in these circumstances? Prior to Medeva, different approaches were taken to this question by the national courts. Most notably, German and Dutch courts adopted what was called an infringement test, which asked whether the product in issue would in theory infringe the basic patent, and if so, Article 3A would be satisfied. The courts of France and the UK, on the other hand, adopted narrower subject matter tests, in which it asked whether the product for which the SBC is sought is part of the new and inventive subject matter of the patent. In Medeva, the CJU ruled in favour of the subject matter approach. Importantly, the court says that the component active ingredients are protected by a basic patent in force if they are specified, the word they used, specified in the wording of the claims. On the facts of this case, this meant the combinations for which SBCs were sought were not protected and the SBCs were not permitted. Shortly after the Medeva ruling, the University of Queensland case, which concerned SPCs on products obtained from a patented process, followed the reasoning in Medeva. However, in Queensland, the word used by the CJU to describe how the subject matter of the basic patent must be disclosed was identified rather than specified, although it's thought that these terms share the same meaning. These decisions have now led to a series of references to the CJU trying to pin down when exactly a product for which SPC protection is sought is identified or specified in the basic patent in force. Must the active ingredients of a combination vaccine be identified explicitly and individually, or is it sufficient for them to be referred to generically, structurally, or functionally? It's these references that I'm going to turn to to explain. Just before doing this though, let me briefly summarise the CJU rulings since Medeva, because these provide further context for the latest cases. Not all of these rulings concern Article 3A directly, but they are relevant and have done little to clarify the area. The tests of whether a product is protected by the patent that these cases appear to employ are summarised on this slide. For example, the Georgetown University case. This addresses the question of how many SBCs are allowed per patent. In its decision, the CJU rules that it is possible, in principle, to obtain several SBCs on the basis of the same basic patent provided that each of the products which the SBCs are sought are protected as such, they're the words they use, as such, by the patent. In Actavis Group and Sanofi, the CJA rules that when the patentee has already obtained an SBC on the basis of a marketing authorization for a single product, the patent holder is precluded from obtaining a second SBC on the basis of the same patent for a combination product, when the other active ingredient in the combination is, again, not protected as such by the patent. 
In the very similar case of Actavis and Boehringer Ingelheim, however, the CJE rules that when an SPC for an active ingredient that, quote, constitutes the sole subject matter of the invention, close quote, of a basic pattern has already been obtained, the holder may not obtain a second SBC for a combination of that claimed ingredient with any other active ingredient that is not part of that subject matter. Now let's look in more detail at Eli Lilly and human genome sciences. Although this case is actually concerned with a patent for therapeutic antibodies to neutrokine alpha rather than a combination or second SBC, it's an important decision on the issue of interpreting Article 3A and has added to the confusion resulting in the latest referrals. In this case, both the patent owner, HGS, and Eli Lilly had developed anti-neutrokine alpha antibody products. Eli Lilly's product, Tabalimab, and HGS's Balimumab. Eli Lilly's concern was that if HGS would be able to obtain an SBC for Balimumab based on its own patent, but relying on Eli Lilly's marketing authorization for Tabalimab when approved. To avoid this possibility, Eli Lilly sought a declaration that any such SBC would be invalid because Tabalimab was not expressly named in the relevant HDS patent. Instead, Eli Lilly argued, the patent is drafted only in functional terms to claim any antibody to neutrokine alpha, and this does not identify or specify Tabalimab for the purpose of Article 3A and the Medova ruling. In its preliminary ruling, the CJU explained that protected by a basic patent in force under Article 3A of the SBC regulation does not require a product to be identified by a structural formula. And in, in this context, that would be the amino acid sequence of the antibody. But that, a but that instead, a functional definition may be acceptable if, once construed, and this is a, a, again a quote, the claims relate implicitly but necessarily and specifically to the active ingredient in question, close quote. The CJAU then placed the onus back on the national court to construe the claims and answer this test. Case was accordingly referred back to Warren Jay in the English Patents Court. Warren Jay's interpretation of the CJU test was in this case that functional definitions could, in principle, bring an active ingredient within the protection of a basic patent. He states that determining whether the claims relate implicitly but necessarily and specifically to the active ingredient means that if the active ingredient is covered by the claims, according to conventional methods of claim interpretation, it is protected for the purposes of Article 3A of the SBC regulation. On the facts of this case, it was conceded during the course of proceedings that Tabalimab fell within the scope of Claim 13 of the patent, even though it was not individually identified. Tab Tabalimab was therefore held to be protected by the basic patent within the meaning of Article 3A. But not every court agrees with this broad interpretation of the Eli Lilly decision. The differing national approaches to Article 3A and the CJE ruling in Eli Lilly have come to a head in two further references to the CJEU, one from the English Patents Court concerning Truvada and the other from the German Federal Patent Court concerning Sitagliptin. There has also been a case concerning a Marcouche formula which was not referred to the CJEU but is worth a mention. First, the Truvada cases. The Druvada cases concern an SBC held by the defendant, Gilead Sciences. The SBC covers Gilead's HIV treatment, Truvada, consisting of a combination of tenofovil, disaproxyl fumarate, and emtricitabine in a fixed dose tablet. The basic pattern in force relied on for the SBC claims a range of compounds, including tenofovil, disaproxyl. Specifically, Claim 27 claims a pharmaceutical composition of a compound of tenofovir disaproxyl together 
it says, with a pharmaceutically acceptable carrier and optionally other therapeutic ingredients. That's the language of the patent. The basic patent does not claim or refer to emtricitabine by name. In the German Truvada case in the regional court of Munich, the issue of the validity of the SBC arose in a, in a request for a preliminary injunction against a number of generic manufacturers. Specifically, the defendants referred to a qualified notice of the German Federal Patent Court in pending nullity proceedings in which the court had expressed its preliminary view that the SPC in question was not valid. This was because, applying the Medeva and in particular Eli Lilly case law, emtricitabine is not identified in a sufficiently specific way in Claim 27 of the basic patent in force. The regional court has agreed with the Federal Patent Court that in the case of combination SPCs, the requirement of Article 3A of the SPC regulation can only be considered fulfilled if two particular requirements are met. One, the combination of active ingredients must be the subject of the invention of the basic patent. And two, the active ingredients must either be identified in the claims of the basic patent by means of a structural formula, or they must be given a functional definition in the claims of the basic patent in a way that the claims can be considered to relate implicitly, but not necessarily and specifically, to the active ingredient in question. The regional court holds that the second requirement is not met on the basis that a structural formula means the explicit specification of the compound in the claims, while a functional formula only implicitly specifies the compound. The regional court also holds that the first requirement, that the combination of tenofovir, disaproxyl, fumarate and emtricitabine is the subject of the invention of the basic patent, is not met. This is because the basic patent only discloses tenofovir, disaproxyl as a mono compound. This is a narrow, uh, narrower approach than that taken by the English Patents Court in Eli Lilly. Decisions in parallel cases concerning tenofovir have also come from the courts of France, Denmark and Switzerland. At first instance in France, again in the context of a preliminary injunction, the court has held that the SPC is likely to be invalid because the word therapeutic ingredient do not give a functional definition of a compound. There is nothing in the patent specification to support emtricitabine as this ingredient. In addition, that court held that emtricitabine was not part of the invention defined by the subject matter of the basic patent. In Denmark, the court also refused a preliminary injunction against the court on the basis that the SBC's combination of tenofovir, disaproxyl and emtricitabine is not protected by the basic patent because the words other therapeutic ingredients in the relevant claim do not specify emtricitabine. The Swiss court, however, does something different. It has so far followed an infringement test of the kind I described earlier for determining whether a product is protected by a basic patent in force of the kind that was actually ruled out by Medeva. In the Gilead Trivada case, the Swiss Federal Patent Court saw no reason to, to depart from this test because even though Swiss SBC leg, uh, legislation was drafted to harmonize with the SBC regulation, as a court of a non-EU state, it is not bound to follow CJEU authority. Using the infringement test, the Swiss court holds that the combination is protected by the basic button in force and the SBC is therefore valid. In a parting shot, the Swiss court, like the English patents court before it, has been critical of the inconsistent state, state of CJEU authority on this issue calling it a terminologisches Durcheinander, a terminological mess. So in the absence of a workable set of criteria and diverging, uh, diverging national decisions on the application of the SPC regulation in this area, the English Patents Court in its Truvada case has requested a preliminary opinion from the CJU on the following simple question. What are the criteria for deciding whether the product is protected by a basic patent in force in Article 3A of the SBC regulation? 
Pending a preliminary ruling by the CJU, Arnold J suggests that the answer is to consider the inventive advance or technical contribution of the basic patent. According to this approach, a product will satisfy Article 3A if it contains an active ingredient or a combination of active ingredients which embodies the inventive advance or technical contribution of the basic patent. When applied to the facts of the case, the combination of agents comprising Truvada does not, the judge suggests, embody the inventive advance of the basic patent. Arnold J considers, considers this approach to be consistent with the objectives of the SPC regulation to encourage and reward innovation in medicinal products and the wording in the CJEU's decisions in Actavis and Boehringer and Actavis Group and Sanofi, which I mentioned earlier. I said a little earlier too that the German Federal Patent Court has also referred questions to the CJU for a preliminary ruling. These concern functional definition claims in a basic patent relating to the treatment of diabetes mellitus by administration of dipeptidyl peptidase 4, DP4, inhibitors. While it discloses a number of specific DB4 inhibitors, the patent in this case also refers to the fact that other unspecified DB4 inhibitors can be used. One such inhibitor not specified by the patent, but which is marketed by a licensee for the treatment of diabetes mellitus, is citagliptin. On the basis that, basis that it's not individually disclosed by the patent, an SBC application for citagliptin was rejected by the German Patent and Trademark Office. On appeal, the Federal Patent Court has stated that the CJ rulings in Medeva and Eli Lilly mean that citagliptin is not disclosed specifically enough to form part of the subject matter of the claims of the patent. However, Aware of the conflicting approach taken by the English Patents Court in Eli Lilly and elsewhere, the court has referred three questions to the CJU. The questions referred ask, in essence, whether a product is only protected by a basic patent in force for the purposes of Article 3A if it is provided in the claims as a specific embodiment. If so, does this mean that for a claim using a general functional definition of a class of active substance, it's not enough for the product to be individualized as a specific embodiment only in the description of the basic patent? It's also asked whether, depending on the answer to these questions, product is protected if it, it is developed using independent inventive activity after the filing date of the basic patent, but nonetheless falls within the functional definition of the claims. Just one last case. This is the one concerning a Marcouche formula that I mentioned a little earlier. It's Sandoz and GD Searle. While this case doesn't deal with combinations and was not referred to the CJU, it does rely on the CJU Eli Lilly ruling to shed light on Medeva and Article 3A. Here, the claimants challenge the validity of an SPC for Doronavir, or the pharmaceutically acceptable salt, ester, or prodrug thereof. Marketed as Prozista, the product is a protease inhibitor used as an antiretroviral medication to treat HIV infection. The basic patent in force on which the SBC relied claimed a Marcouche formula generically covering Doronavir. So Doronavir was not specified or identified in any of the claims of the patent by a specific name or structure or anywhere in the specification. There was also no teaching in the patent appointed to it. Arnold J agreed with the defendants that although the correct interpretation of Article 3A remained unclear in certain respects, it did not matter for the purposes of this case. In his judgment, Eli Liddy made it clear that it's not necessary for the active ingredient to be identified in the claim by means of a structural formula. It's sufficient for the active ingredient to be covered by a functional description provided that the claims, and here are those magic words again, relate implicitly but necessarily and specifically to the active ingredient. In other words, it's not necessary for the claim individually to name or depict the active ingredient and a Marcouche formula is sufficient. It must be very doubtful that some of the other jurisdictions referred to above, especially Germany, 
would have come to the same conclusion. Furthermore, the judge holds that it's not necessarily an objection that the claim in question covers a large number of other compounds in addition to the active ingredient in question. The judge also repeats his view, given in Truvada, that a better test than those so far set out by the CJU would be to ask whether the product falls within the claim and whether it embodies the inventive advance or technical contribution of the claim. So how can these cases on Article 3A be summarised? It's clear that the national judges are having difficulty in interpreting the CGAU case law, which is of course unsatisfactory for decision makers in industry who need reliable guidance. However, it could be said, very broadly at the moment, that the English court has taken a more liberal approach to Eli Lilly than Germany and some of the other EU courts. So we have to hope that one or other, or preferably both, of the two new referrals to the CJU bring some clarity on the issue. However, as you'll appreciate, much of the problem here is that it's the CJU, CJU rulings themselves that are providing the inconsistency in the first place. Now, moving on from this subject, there is, however, another area of uncertainty in the SBC area. This is the EU Commissioner's Plan for SBC reform, and Simon is going to talk about this now. Thank you, Paul. Yes, on 12th October of this year, 2017, the European Commission published its much-anticipated public consultation on SPCs and patent research exemptions. The consultation is part of the Commission's single market strategy adopted in October 2015, in which it is looking for ways to improve the patent system in Europe. In particular, it is focusing on pharmaceutical and other industries whose products are subject to marketing authorizations. The consultation follows the publication earlier this year of the Commission's Inception Impact Assessment, which sets out in detail the Commission's specific policy objectives for the strategy and, and its proposed options for reform. Two proposed options for reform are aimed at aspects of SPT, SPC protection. One, creating a unified SPC title, and two, introducing an SPC manufacturing waiver. The issue of providing unitary SPC protection is of course a result of the unitary patent system that will be available once the unified patent court comes into being, or should I say if and when the unified patent court comes into being. So far, none of the legislation that has been drafted for the new system creates such an SPC. The Commission's view is that a unitary SPC title would bring enhanced certainty to, industry, to industries whose products are subject to regulated marketing authorizations compared to the current system in which SPCs are granted by national patent officers. In particular, national patent offices can, of course, take varying approaches to grants and have only national territorial effects. The Commission also considers that increased certainty will make it easier both for manufacturers, manufacturers of novel and generic or biosimilar medicines to make investment decisions on the launch of their products. The idea of a unitary patent raised issues, however, such as the type of marketing authorizations on which the unitary SPC would be, would be based. Would it require a central marketing authorization or be based on the first national authorization? Would it be possible to obtain only national SPCs based on a unitary patent, and can national SPCs be converted, etc.? Whatever the answers to these questions may turn out to be, the European Commission appears to be moving in the direction of the unitary SPC. The Commission communication also introduced another new idea, as mentioned, that of an SPC manufacturing waiver. The rationale for this is set out in a staff working document accompanying the Commissioner communication which explains the disadvantage faced by EU-based manufacturers when producing for export markets. Quoting, manufacturers of generic and biosimilar medicines based in non-EU countries where SPC protection does not exist, 
such as Brazil, Russia, India and China, enter markets in which patent protection expired up to five years earlier than EU-based manufacturers. This is possible because EU-based manufacturers are not allowed to produce in EU member states during the period of SPC protection of the reference medicine. Furthermore, this situation under, circumst under certain circumstances gives an unintended lead time to non-EU-based operators to enter EU member states following the expiry of that SPC protection. Such a situation could have the effect of encouraging European manufacturers of generic and biosimilar medicines to move their production outside the EU, either via delocalization or long-term outsourcing contracts, to overcome these legal hurdles and to stay competitive. The proposed SPC manufacturing waiver for export purposes is therefore intended to allow EU-based manufacturers of generic and biosimilar medicines to compete in EU markets on an equal footing with companies from non-EU countries. The question then is how long until we can expect such a measure to be made law? The answer to this is that even if the Commission pursues the waiver idea when it's reviewed the responses to its consultation, it could take several years until legislation is agreed by the Council and Parliament. It also depends on whether other more general and far-reaching amendments are intended by the Commission. In particular, this would be an opportunity for the Commission to address the questions that have given rise to inconsistent decisions of the kind Udit and Paul have described. For example, are FPCs intended to be restricted to small molecule drugs or wider classes of medicinal products such as functionally defined biologics? And what about non-active ingredients that have a synergistic effect or new uses for an old product? It is not clear if the Commission intends to address these issues. So finally, conclusions for the time being. As you have heard, there are more pressing uncertainties about the existing legislation that need to be cleared up. In particular, we need a simple and predictable system that can be implemented by national patent offices in a uniform manner. Mr. Justice Arnold, Arnold expressed this as the need for bright line rules in future cases. Hopefully he will get these in the Braxis, Travada and Sitagliptine cases, but past experience suggests this cannot be relied upon. If not, then perhaps we will have to look to reform of the legislation to assist. In any case, we here at Taylor Wessing will keep you informed and would urge you to sign up to receive monthly updates from our life sciences microsite, Synapse, where we will be posting this webinar on further developments on SPCs. For now, it remains for me to thank you for joining us and to remind you to please fill our feedback survey, which will appear on your screens a few moments after I stop speaking. Thank you.